The following interview was conducted with Charles B. Roth, Professor Emeritus of Agronomy for the Purdue University Oral History Program that took place on Wednesday, July 7, 2010 at Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Good afternoon, Professor Roth. Thank you very much. Let's year. start off by telling us where and when you were born and parents in early years. Well, uh, I was born in April 27, 1942. Uh, I was born while my parents were at the University of Missouri. So you're a Missourian then, huh? I was a Missourian, okay. and um, uh, Dad was in school. Mom, you know, had dropped out. You know, she was there, but she had dropped out after they got married. Uh -huh. And um, then uh, we were born in April, and I'm an identical twin. So there's two of us, and Mom didn't know it until she got to the hospital. <laughs> and so. Uh, Is it boys? Both boys? Both boys, identical twins. And even today, we're still very few people who tell us apart. That's interesting. And uh, so um, we were born in April, and Dad uh, graduated from the university in, in June of that year. But he didn't wasn't commissioned. He was an ROTC student, but he wasn't commissioned until the following year. And so he didn't go into the war until '43. What did he do? What did you do in the interim? He did was you stay uh, there. No, he. Uh, my mother uh, was born in southeast Missouri, uh, raised there, and my grandfather, when he moved there, with my mother was seven at the time. Um, he developed a, quite a farming operation down there, with cotton, cotton gins, and so on. And Dad went back down and worked with my grandfather down there in the cotton fields and cotton gin you know, in that interim. And uh, then uh, when he got his commission, then he was immediately, you know, drafted at that point into service. And uh, then he moved from, you know, from there to Oklahoma. And he was in the service in Oklahoma for a few months, then down to Brownwood, Texas. And both of those days, mom and the two of us, of course, uh, went with him. And so we, we moved around that period of time. And, during those, uh, about a year and four, three months or four months, something like that. Then Dad was uh, transferred to Hawaii. And of course, you know, travel restrictions at that point, you know, meant Mom couldn't go. Sure. And so she had to stay either with one of the other parents, uh, either, you know, either one of my grandparents, <laughs> you know, and, and Dad's parents were lived up in Centralia, Missouri, and then mom's parents lived in southeast Missouri so she's moving back and forth sure. during this time and, and then uh, dad uh, trained uh, fuel artillery in uh, Hawaii and uh, the story is is that he was actually on ship when they had a bomb dropped and uh, as a was result going in that going to Japan do you think oh yeah oh. he was on ship to go to Japan he had been in, he had been in training troops in Hawaii now for about a year and a half, and he was on ship to go to Japan for the invasion. And since he was on ship and not out of harbor, they immediately disembarked those troops, and they became the troops that transited the, the troops out of the theater through Hawaii back to the U.S. And so he was he was the one responsible for actually getting a lot of our troops back out of the theater through Hawaii back to the U.S., wow. you know, during that period. The troops that had already left harbor became the Japanese occupation troops. Oh, that's interesting. And so they went on to, Hawaii, to Japan and were the occupation troops. The troops that were actually in theater, you know, and, and before that, they were, they were mustered out of the service. But and that included him? No, oh. see, Dad wasn't. He wasn't on. He he oh. wasn't in the theater. Right. He was he, just on the on the island. He, he was on the island training troops, okay. and he wasn't actually in in the war zone. And so, uh, he he sat there in Hawaii for another about six or eight months, you know, transiting troops back out, you know, and uh, sending them on their way back. Sending home. them on their sure. way back home. And okay. So, and so, so he was. Yeah, I've seen him here. Mother had seen him for a while. Well, that's it. See, um, he didn't see us. Um, all, you know, we were together probably for about the first 
eight or nine months, and then he was gone, see, for the next uh, about 14 months or 16 months before he actually got back. And, that was a big reunion. And so it, uh, and it created a lot of problems with mom and she, you know, all that, oh, yeah. that you, as you would expect. Sure. It, uh, it worked out, and, and uh, the, um, I have a younger brother who was 10 years younger than the two of us. He is actually still in Southeast Missouri, and we have farm, extensive farming operations there, mm, good. and we still actively farm. Right. And, uh, well, tell us about your early school years, and then where'd you get settled after your dad got back? Well, we, uh, my grandfather on my mother's side, uh, they had um, they had eight children. My grandfather gave each one of the children 160 acres of ground when they got married. And so when mom and dad, you know, got back together after the war, they had a farm to take care of. To take care of. And so dad began a cotton farmer. But having a, a college degree at that point, and have, have already been in a training situation, he actually was selected to go into the uh, veterans uh, vocational uh, program. And he actually trained veterans after the war in agriculture in southeast Missouri for a number of years. And it was because of that that he then was asked to go into the faculty at the University of Missouri. And so he became a university uh, faculty member, but stationed in southeast Missouri. Oh, he was like not the extension there or the uh, very county similar to a, Very similar to extension, but not, a, no, they had an extension service down sure. there. But he was not a member of the extension right. service. He was but actually similar, on the, he was said. on the faculty, at, 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 but he was doing research in southeast Missouri for agriculture. How about that? What and, a great opportunity for him! And so, and he did that for many years, and and actively farmed. He was farming at that point about 400 acres of ground. What was on the? Were we doing cotton? Or? We we're we're far enough south. We can raise cotton and corn, soybeans, and wheat are our main crops. Do you still have the farm? Yes, we still oh. farm well over 1,200 acres down there. Oh, that's pretty good. And, uh, but all that, you know, the granddad, before he passed away, gave each one of his sets of grandchildren 160 acres of ground. He sure had a lot of property. He did. <laughs> a lot of land. <laughs> and, and the thing is, is when he moved from Arkansas to Missouri, he moved with what he could carry in a horse-drawn wagon, hmm. and he had nothing. You know, uh, he had lost his ground in Arkansas because of taxes, and so he came to Southeast Missouri and had he nothing. From the and he up, started right? from the ground up. Yeah. And, and before he passed away, he had given away so much ground to his children and his grandchildren. He still had a full section left. <laughs> good planning. <laughs> so he was he was very good in a cotton gin. He actually sure. built his own cotton gin. And, and, very good. See, and this was at the time when cotton was hand harvested. Yeah, I imagine. And uh, I grew up hand picking cotton and chopping cotton as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> and during my high school period down there was when cotton went from ninety five percent hand picked to ninety five percent machine picked in a wow. three year period. Um, I stayed at, at Malden, you know, and uh, but I'm an unusual faculty member at Purdue. How's that? Because I'm a high school dropout. I never graduated from high school. How did that occur? What? Well, there was a big problem in our school system. What uh, town were you living in? We were, live, we were living outside of Malden, Missouri. Okay. Uh, we actually were in a different school district, and so mom and dad had to transport us into Malden, you know, from all the way from the first grade on. First grade was in a small two-room schoolhouse, you know, half a mile away. Sure. And then mom started in, you know, knew we couldn't get an education there that we really needed. And so they started in transporting us into Malden, out of school district. They, by car, not by, by bus? By they car. did it themselves. They had to because, see, they were out of district. See, we were actually in the Risco School District, but right. Risco didn't have a very good school system. And so mom 
and Dad talked with them all in the school system. They accepted us, and so they transported us. And then my brother, who was 10 years younger than us, transported him too. So for 21 years there, you were they doing a lot of carts <laughs> service there, right? Yeah. And so it was it was quite an operation for them, but but it it worked out for them and worked out for us. Sure. What was high school like, and then you say you dropped out? Or? Well, I didn't drop out. Uh, what happened was is that um, in the summer between of my junior year in, in high school, my brother and I had taken full course loads, you know, the whole time we were in high school, in the first three years. And in the summer of that year, of our junior year, the school board fired the superintendent, who had been superintendent for over 20 years fired him to get out of having to pay his retirement benefits. And uh, as a result, all but one teacher of the high school resigned. And so we were looking at a senior year of all brand new teachers, you know, in the school system. And uh, we had had taken enough classes, you, you only needed 15, you know, academic classes to go to college. And so uh, in late July of that year, we went up to Southeast Missouri State College at Cape Girardeau, Missouri, walked into Dean Rowe's office. We'd sent his trans our transcripts up. He looked at transcripts, said, well, entrance exams start in 15 minutes. Do you want to take them? Oh, that's interesting. And three weeks later, we were in college. It was that quick. Now, could you do that today? No. <laughs> There's no way. You know, times are different. Times are different yeah. today. Yeah. But see, that was purely on the discretion of Dean Rose at that time. Sure. So the two of you headed out there. And the two of us headed up to Cape Girardeau, and so we were in school there for two years before we transferred to University of Missouri. Okay. Well, tell us about college life. Wait a minute. Student or activities? Did you live on campus? And what's um, campus life like? Well, at South East Missouri State in Cape, uh, we actually. We were too late. See, they'd already filled the dorms. And so we had to live off campus. We weren't left with any choices. But we found a very interesting home. It was a home of a university professor and his wife, young couple. Uh, they had two young children. And there was five boys that stayed in the upper floor of their home. And he was in the science department, in geology. and. Uh, so, you know, if they needed to be out, then one of us would babysit the two kids. And <laughs> it all worked out for out. them. And, sure. and we'd go out and study and come back, and she'd have uh, bread made for us in the evening, for, you know, hot, fresh bread. And we'd sit there and play cards for an hour or two. And <laughs> you know, it was, it was really it was a, a good, it was a good, good time. environment. Yeah. Good environment. Sure. And very nice, you know, family to stay with. And, they uh, had always had five boys there in the house, you know, the whole time, the two years we were there. Yeah. And it all worked out well for us. And, and then you decided to switch to? Well, we knew originally we'd probably eventually go to the University of Missouri. Okay. It was just, that's only a two-year college? Or no, it, it was it was a four-year college, but it was in reality a, a, uh, it was a state college at that time really designed for so training teachers. teachers teacher training like Indiana State was yes. at one time. Yes, yes, very much so. It has now become a full-blown university. Sure. You know, but uh, at that time, Missouri had five of these located in the five sections of the state, one in the central and then one in each corner. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it was well for Missouri, you know, to do that. And uh, then we, uh, I was involved during that time, I was on the yearbook staff, I was a staff photographer you know, for the two years I was there. And then uh, we were involved quite heavily with the Wesley Foundation, which is a you know, Methodist Church's student, sure. campus student organization. And so we were involved in that. And uh, then... Uh, we were both in, taking the same similar programs? Similar programs. Uh, both, we were both oriented into, into science and into chemistry. And uh, had a very, uh, you know, you go back and you look at people that have influenced you and, and you know, as, as professors and so on, yeah. and you see an individual that, you know, has a dramatic impact on what happened to you later on. And, and that person was John Caskey. He was a professor, you know, in the chemistry department. 
Was at uh, Missouri? At, at, at Southeast Missouri State that had a photographic memory. And you didn't fool him, you know. He'd go, he'd spend the first lecture going through the roll and having you raise your hand or stand up or something. And the next time, without a seating chart, he would call you by name. <laughs> that is an unusual trait. And yeah. his wife was the same way. <laughs> <laughs> he and his wife both. And uh, I had uh, I had four classes under him by the time I was at Cape. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I had a absolutely phenomenal chemistry training. And so when I went up to the University of Missouri, you know, I was, you know, hands down ahead of anybody else in a, in a junior class chemistry up there. That's good. You know, because most of the time, students at the university would never take physical chemistry, even as chemistry majors wouldn't take it to grad school. And I had it as a senior, as an undergrad, you know, because I had the training to do it. And so it was, uh, it worked out well for yeah. us. Then what, uh, when, you, when you graduated, what came next? Well, I... Did you uh, live on campus when you were there? Uh, at the University of Missouri, we lived off campus. Okay. Um, Do you have yeah, just, uh, just a Just a block off campus. You know, again, it was in a home of an elderly woman that had uh, three boys staying in her house. And my brother and I were one, and then we had another boy there staying in the... Sure, and, that's good. And it was right, well, uh, there... Uh, Sandburn Field, which is a, a uh, on-campus ag research field, uh, and still active today. It's, it's the second oldest field in the nation. Uh, there's only two older in the world, and uh, it uh, was right across the street from our, where we lived. <laughs> you know, it was right there, and so we were then a half a block of the, you know, the main part of the campus. Sure. And so, That's good. And so. Yeah, we could. Pro we were probably closer than some of the dorms were. <laughs> the I would think so, right? Yeah. And uh, we stayed there, and then wasn't as actively involved there. I, I was involved in the Wesley Foundation as a student. You know, as a student. You probably had a lot of activities too. And and um, had a lot of activities there. You know, was president of the Wesley Foundation for a year, and and. Uh, the, you know, the state of Missouri had 13 Wesley Foundations at that time, and they had a statewide organization, and I was an officer in that as well. Sure. And my wife and I, you know, when I met Roberta, you know. Did you meet her there? I met her there. Okay. And uh, she uh, was a freshman when I met her, and so she was actually two years behind me. What was she going to make? What was she majoring in? She was majoring in elementary education. Oh, okay. And, uh, that influence, that timing influenced uh, the time that we were that I was there because we stayed. I stayed an extra semester there on my master's program because I went on to get my master's there. I could have finished the semester earlier, but I stayed on for an extra semester to allow her finish. to finish her undergraduate degree in elementary education before you know we had to move to okay. Wisconsin. And then, then did you go on to grad school? You went up there. Did I you get married in the meantime? Uh, we got married um, uh, right before um, we got married in, in August, and then uh, we went to Wisconsin in March, all in March. And what was your uh, graduate work in? What area? Uh, my undergraduate at the University of Missouri was actually in ag chemistry. Uh, that Which chemi is that what, department. Uh, biochemistry used to well, be a little bit here. There was there a, was, a there Department was. of Agricultural Chemistry, as I recall. Well, um, at that time... It might have been different than... There there. It was Ag Chemistry. Now, okay. that, subsequently, that department was rolled over into the Biochemistry Department of the Med School at the yeah, University of Missouri. Wisconsin? No, okay. at Missouri. Oh, at Missouri. Oh, at okay. Missouri. Hmm. Now, my master's program was in soils. And, see, my father was a associate professor of soils at mm -hmm. that time and then um, all my research work was actually sure. in soils but I actually got started in research very early see because you know when I was growing up you know and, and uh, you know it was about the time I was in the seventh or eighth grade I was helping dad put out experiment plots in Southeast Missouri okay. <laughs> during the summertime and so, that's nice and so you got a heads up early I, had a, I got a heads up early on mm -hmm. experimental work and so you know, and so I had 
I had field experience, which a lot of graduate students never had, right. you know, before I ever got to grad school. Sure. And so, well, I went on after after my uh, uh, work, you know, as an undergrad. I went on and got my graduate and master's degree with C.E. Marshall, or C.M. Marshall, or C.M. Woodruff, uh, there, which was a soil physicist and soil chemist. And C.E. Marshall was a member of my committee, which is probably one of the world-renowned soil chemists at the time. At uh, Missouri? At, at Missouri. Okay. And, Good. And he, uh, and then, uh, it's kind of interesting at that point when I got uh, got ready to go over to see about where would I go to get a Ph.D. program. You didn't want to continue on there? No, and I was advised not to. Okay. Um, and and the advice was was valid and, and was you need to get out and experience other people than than what you find at one institution. Sounds logical. And so I was uh, my brother was a half a year ahead of me because he, he didn't have that extra semester need and so he had gotten married and he went out to Cornell under Mike Peach at Cornell. For his PhD was this work. a similar area as you were yes. in soil? Okay. He was in soils, and in fact, C. E. Marshall was his major prof for his master's program. And uh, the uh, Mike Peach offered both of us assistantships at, at Cornell. I didn't accept mine. You know, my brother accepted his because you know he was at the point where he needed to make that decision and. But I could, could wait for a little while, and so I had some other feelers out, and lo and behold, I got an offer to Purdue University under Joe White. This is at the after the masters. After the masters, after you know, the, for my PhD program, okay. and I was also offered under C.I. Rich at, at Virginia Polytech, and then I almost accepted the one to Purdue. Uh, and was going to accept it the next day. And I got a phone call from uh, M. L. Jackson at the University of Wisconsin, and he called me, offered me a, a, a assistantship there. It was a higher level assistantship. It was a three quarter time appointment, and um, and he asked me, "Well, are so you considering?" Any Places else, and I told him, "Well, I was looking at Joe White at Purdue and and uh, Charlie Rich at, at BPI." He said, "Well, they're both good people. You realize that they both got their PhD degrees with me." <laughs> <laughs> Just thought I'd pass this along, <laughs> right? And so I accepted ML's assistantship. At at the University of Wisconsin, and so we went up there in March okay. uh, of that year. Oh, that's good. Then you're when you finally finished. What came next? Did you have any? Were you serving the military at all? No. Oh. Uh, that was kind of an interesting. And again, this is where the university research program came into play. Uh -huh. My, uh, I would have been susceptible to the draft while I was at Wisconsin. That would have been one in the. Vietnam and, War or whatever? Well, it would have been, see, I came here in 68, okay. and I went up there in 65, and that would have been um, Vietnam. was Vietnam. just beginning to yep. And um, I was on a research grant for the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission. Up there at Wisconsin? At Wisconsin. And um, Dr. Jackson uh, asked for and was granted, you know, a pardon for me for the draft, the presidential pardon, and we got those two years in a row, and so I never served. Mm -hmm. uh, I would have, but, uh, you know, with that research grant, the way it was, it was, it was considered to be a national, you know, security issue, sure. and so Good. we were granted a presidential pardon, and, and so I never served. The, um, once I, um, you know, I worked up there in an area of, of research that, uh, that dealt with exchange properties in soils and physical properties in soils. And so they, they were looking at that for military purposes. And so that's the reason it wasn't granted, mm -hmm. you know, that I didn't sure. go into the draft. The, uh, 
the interesting thing is, is there was a, you know, you, you look back and you see how some of your, your research over along the line have an overall, you know, indication coming into play. Sure. And there was an observation I made on my master's program that was reinforced in my PhD program that subsequently wasn't explained until about uh, 20 years into my program here at Purdue. That's kind of nice to know that. You yeah. know, and, and it's, it's those things that, that come back to be in the back of your mind as you go through your research The curiosity career. stays on. Yes. As you continue it, it revolves and circulates, and, percolates. Right, right. And, and at the point of my master's program, the items were in place to explain it. Even at the point of my PhD program, it wasn't in place to explain it. Sure. And it wasn't until we did quite a bit of work here before we could actually explain what was right. going on. And so it's one of those things you, you always constantly, you know, going back and re-looking at things. I know, and, which is kind of nice. And so it, it, Retrospective is always good. Right. <laughs> but um, it was, um, I worked there in exchange properties and, and clays and, and soils and, and uh, then um, I got finished, got to the point where I was getting about ready to get finished up and so I started looking around and met Dr. Uh, John Peterson at the agronomy meetings in uh, what would have been the fall of, fall of 67, yes, which came here in, in October 68, so in fall of 67 I met Dr. Peterson at the agronomy meetings and uh, subsequent communication with him, he offered me a postdoctoral. And uh, with that in hand, then uh, I could force Dr. Peterson, to see, or I mean Dr. Uh, Jackson, to see if I could get me wrapped up, <laughs> get a thesis written, <laughs> and so on. And so we got that written, and I came down to Purdue immediately uh, in October. You know, and got my thesis handed in on Friday, and I was on Purdue staff on Monday. <laughs> wow, that's <laughs> on, pretty good. <laughs> you know, so. Where'd you live when you first came here? We lived in Beaujardin Apartments oh for one goodness. year in a brand new one. They just built the building. You know, they built that in several phases, you know. I remember and that, right. We were about halfway back in that complex. And, uh, it was handy and oh, well, great location. It was kind of interesting, though, uh, where we, you know, by us being there, because it also, it gives you an insight as to how things come to play and how it can influence what, what you do. At that time, LARS, which was a laboratory for application remote sensing, had just been started. And they had one of the complexes out in Flex Lab 2, right across the street from Beaujardin. And I knew Marion Baumgartner and met him in some meetings before, and Marion worked with that group over there. And he asked me when I, you know, after I'd been here and was, you know, working with Dr. Peterson on a postdoctoral here, if I'd be interested in, in coming over and seeing what they're doing. And so I was. And so I was just across the street, so it'd be nothing uncommon for me to go over there at 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning in order to get to their computer and go over and fire that computer up from scratch. And it was a big IBM mainframe. I've heard that that's what, well, that's what they had in those days. Yeah, yeah. And, it was, and this was a big computer. You know, it was the biggest thing, it was the biggest one on the campus at the time. And we go over and fire that thing up, you know, at 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning and, <laughs> and do work until the rest of the crew came in at, at 6 or 7, and then we go home. <laughs> and then I'd come to Purdue, see, and, you know, in the Dr. Peterson's lab and work all day. <laughs> yeah, but. I got interested in doing some of that, and I, did, I continued to do some large work for sure. about four or five years. I was here on a one-year appointment, and during that time, I was, you know, actively looking for, a, you know, a position, and um, working with Dr. Peterson on, on effective iron oxides in soils, and uh, because he was interested, this was a follow-up to work that I was doing in minerals up at, at Wisconsin. 
and that's an area that he was interested in. And uh, so it was a mutual, you know, collaboration there, and, and it worked out well in his what he was trying to do here. Was he the head? He was head of the department, which is unusual. He actually was head of the department at and the time. And running the research. And he was running, he only ran one postdoctoral. He didn't have any graduate students, he just had one postdoctoral. And um, we'll get back to that and I'll discuss some of the implications of what that meant because what he did is that, um, you know, I was actively looking for a position at that time and had several interviews and I went down to, to a Kalen company down in Georgia. And um, it was Hubert Kalen called me down for interview and I went down and, and this was about, oh, probably nine or ten months, at least ten months after I've been here. So it's been, came in October, so it'd be July, August, you know, the next year. And uh, went down, had the interview, went through all the process and got ready to wrap it up and they offered me a position, Hubert Kalen. And so I said, well, I'm going to think about it, you know. Roberta was there with me, you know, and, and I said, well, we just have to think about it and get back with you. And so we came back to Purdue, and, and uh, the next day I was walking down the hallway in Lily Hall. And Dr. Peterson saw me coming, and he stopped. He said, well, I was interviewed. I said, well, I've been offered a position at Hubert Kalen. Well, would you consider a position here? I said, yes, I would. And he offered me a position here at Purdue University. How fortunate. You know, and, well, as a sideline, and this goes later, much later, at the time I didn't know what that involved. And, uh, and, uh, and the limb. Did you for him? the offer from him uh -huh. because he went out on a limb like you wouldn't believe. He had no clearance for the position. He redefined a position he had without talking with his faculty. But see, Dr. Peterson had been hired to build this department at Brown. He was hired right at the end of the war. 46, 40, 49. 48 something. Yeah, something like that. And see, and he was hired to build the agronomy department. And so he hired, you know, at the time I came, he had hired every faculty member here. It existed before he came. Oh, yeah. yeah oh, right. yeah. It existed way back. I'm sure it's an older one. It's a very old on. department. And, uh, but he was hired to build it up. And to build it up, you see, it was, a, it was a teaching department up to that point. Very little research. Teaching of, 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 of agronomy, no agronomy. You know, he, their faculty was designed to actually teach agricultural students. It, they had a very, the they had department. a very, they had a very weak research group, particularly in basic research. They had applied research, but no, practically nothing in basic research. And he was hired to build the whole, the whole department sure. and and take care of its main three purposes, which was extension, research, and teaching and answered all of it. And so he essentially built that department. He had a big challenge. He had a big challenge, but he had done it well. See, he had been here. See, I came in, I came in 68, so he had been here, you know, for 20 years. And uh, so he had quite a reputation on the campus of building a department. Mm -hmm. And and because he had a very, very strong department, and I knew that. He was one of the top in the nation. And, um, but he, what I found out, you know, much later, actually this was probably at least 15 years later, yeah, what he had thinking, done, yeah. what he had done. That, that occurs. <laughs> you know, and, and. It's uh, nice. And we, so. He was it, able to pull it together. He pulled it together because he felt that was the way the department needed to move it. And he respected you and knew that you had the qualifications that yeah. he was looking for. So, he didn't want to lose you. Well, that's basically it. Yeah. Sure. And. So you have to take a, a gamble. That's right, and, and that's what he did, and uh, it worked out well for me. I was, oh, yeah. I was, you know, uh, I didn't hesitate. You know, I accepted the position that day. 
you know, and, and stayed here. In hindsight, was it a good move? I think it was. What the position was at Huber, I found out much later, was I was being interviewed to replace the fellow that interviewed me and director of research. <laughs> Huber Kalin. <laughs> Interesting. Because he left Huber Kalin two years after that, and he knew he was leaving at the time he interviewed me. And uh, he knew he was leaving. He was trying to re recruit his replacement. And so it would have been, in, you know, how things like that happen. <laughs> Everybody experiences these things sometimes more than once. And so, you know, and so, you know, some of them coincidence, some of them, you know, you know, luck, some of them, you know, right. just being in the right spot at the right time. Sure. You know, and, 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 but it worked out well. I think, you know, I have no, you know, I have no doubt that, you know, I made the right, the right decision move. at the time, you know, and I've right enjoyed decision. it. I've right. enjoyed my career here the rest of the time. Talk about your research that you were involved in. Did you continue with the soils and things? Well, what was the basic one that you were doing? Well, actually, um, initially my work, you know, dealt after I went on, to, you know, uh, as an assistant professor, we got grant, you know, got some funding for some grants in, in erosion research. Uh, and so it involved a lot of field work. But it was an erosion research project with a very strong scientific background. Just didn't go out and run erosion plot studies. We tried to develop the parameters that we could predict erosion from and do this on subsoils, which you'd have in construction sites. Because at this point, see, we, Walt Wishmeyer here had done a lot of work to predict erosion off of agricultural land. And he had a predictive model for it, and it was extensively used by the U U.S. Conservation Service uh, as a prediction of uh, erosion. And that's what was basis for all the erosion um, conservation uh, studies around this whole country was the basis of his universal soil loss equation. And, uh, but he had nothing to predict erosion off of construction sites. And this was becoming quite a big problem at that time because they had a lot of construction areas. They were definitely eroding at a different, you know, differently than what agricultural soils were, mm -hmm. but they didn't know what affected it. And so we were able to predict you know, actually develop a predictive model for erosion off construction sites. Sounds great. You know, a five-year project, you know, and, uh, two collaborators, you know, uh, actually two collaborators on the university faculty and one in the USDA. Uh, Matt Rompkins was here at that time and Daryl Nelson and Lee Summers. And four of us worked on that project and developed that model. and. Uh, so that's where I really started. At that same time, I was carrying on some, still doing some, continuing to do some work in, at Lars in the laboratory of application of remote sensing and uh, continued to do that. But then dropped that program when, you know, uh, they expanded out, you know, and really weren't involving, you know, much into the soils area. They were more into crops. And so, uh, I published one paper out there in soils and spectral properties of soils, but I didn't go much beyond that. And then it came back in, and, and uh, at about that time, you know, I'd been here five, six years, and I went on sabbatical leave. And I do, you know, my work at this point had been all basic research. I did very little teaching, if any. Um, I had started teaching a um, training our graduate students on technical presentations. And I continued that for the rest of my career. That was really the, the one class I had during the whole time I was here. You know, I trained students in, in, in soil seminar. And in reality, in reality, that soil seminar was their one where we trained them to, to present technical presentations. And it turned out to be quite successful because I had students for many, many years that got national awards and that's presentations. Nice. Yeah. And, so. and that's key to start. That's very important. You know, because, you know, that was one of those classes that every year 
you totally revamped it because of new technology. That's right. And that's, you, know, you have to keep up with it, right. <laughs> you know, I grew up, you know, started the class with, with uh, these students drawing out their graphs on, in the ink, you know, and, and, and Leroy lettering sets. Sure. Until the last semester I taught it was all on a PowerPoint, PowerPoint. presentation. <laughs> <laughs> and everything in between. <laughs> God, yeah, it's like the Xerox and copying over the years, how that's changed a lot. That's right. Yeah. So, but, but what happened at that point was kind of interesting because, see, I came here, I knew Joel White very well because he'd grad, he had gotten his degree with, with M.L. Jackson, and I met Joel from, for many years at the agronomy meetings and the Clay Mineral Society meetings, and so I knew Joel, and I worked with Joel a little bit, and, but at about that point, I started in working with Philip Lau in our department. And Phil was at a point in his career where he was, had developed some concepts in water interaction with mineral surfaces, but he was getting into experimental areas that he wasn't familiar with, and he needed that research in different experimental techniques that he really didn't have the expertise to handle. And I did. And so we started in collaborating at that point. And that was probably one of the most fruitful collaborations I could ever ask for. We published over 25 papers together, which is almost half of my publications at Purdue. Uh, because it was a collaboration where he could develop the scientific, you know, theoretical background to it, but he couldn't prove it. And I could develop the experimental background to prove it. And, great combination. And so it's a great combination to have, and we worked well together. And he was just two doors down from mine, and you know, we could constantly be in con sure. you know, contact. And he had graduate students, I had graduate students, and we had a lot of joint graduate students, and, you know. And, and, and it was one of these that, you know, we weren't looking to, to uh, getting credit for this idea or that idea, we were looking to develop concept right. and prove it. And, uh, that was one of those things that I've seen change over the years at Purdue, and we can cover that here in the last part of our interview and, and okay. about some of the things I've seen change and to the better and to the worse. Okay, sounds good. Uh, I was going to ask you, committees, uh, we'll talk about the change. Co uh, committees, you served on a number. Were you in the Senate? I was in the Senate for nine years. I was... Um, were you, the were you ever the chair? I was, I was not the chair of the Senate. Okay. I was chair of the University Resource Policy Committee oh, okay. um, under, you know, un, you know, with President Beering at the time when he was president. Uh, I was on... Uh, that's one of the key committees that... Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. See, because that's the only committee of the Senate that meets with the president. Uh, and... Uh, as a chair of, the, of one of those six standing committees, there's a very uh, very interesting other committee that you're on. Very few, few people know about. Which is? The chair of those committees, the six standing committees of the Senate, meet with the president and vice president of the university in a monthly meeting. There are no minutes taken and no subject off limits. Anything can come up. Not vice. You mean vice? Uh, there's no vice president. Here. Well, at, the, at this time, see, oh, the executive the vice. executive yeah. vice president was Bob Ringle. I was thinking of that. I'm trying to clarify that yeah. for the researchers because you know it's yeah, not see, the vice Bob president of the university, but it's executive vice president. See, we didn't yeah. have a provost at that time. Right. right. You did with Hanson, and then when um, that was changed and became the executive vice president. That's and correct. And then, right. Exactly. See, and during that time, see. Hanson was there, and you know you had one, and then you had Cotton Robinson, right? Versus, uh, and then, uh, and then uh, Ringo C was there, executive vice president, you know, and, and uh, so we met with Ringo and, and Baring, you know, once a month, boy. And when you were on the committee, was it when Dr. Baring came in? So it was about '83 when he came, or had you been on the Senate before that? Do you think? Let's see. Because he came no, in '83. You know. He came in in '83. Uh, and I don't think I went on the Senate until about 88 or 89. Oh, okay. 
uh, you know, was late in his, you know, I was on the selection committee that selected Jensky. Oh, okay. Uh, as a chair of the resource policy committee, the chairs were automatically on that selection committee and okay. from the faculty. And uh, so I was on that committee at the time. But the... Uh, when you were still on the Senate, so being a chair of the Senate, you were put on the research committee? Yes. Okay. okay. Bering was here from 83 to 2000, 2001. Right. Yeah, see, um, he would have been, yeah, about 2000, I think. See, I retired in 01. That's when I retired. I retired early. I retired in 58. But did you complete your time on the search committee for? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was he here. He came in '01. He came in '01, and uh, I uh, I retired in July of '01, and he'd okay. come earlier than that. And okay. We completed, and they all been selected, and so on. And so, you know, I knew him from that aspect. Sure. I really didn't know him as a faculty member, you know, here actively sure. you know, at the time. Well, that's it for the researchers. That's a key committee. You just make yes. a, just make a comment or two so they. Yeah, it's a it's a key committee because in reality, you've got several other key committees of the university reporting to you. You know, all the facilities and the long range planning of the university comes through that committee. You know, we look at the long range plans. The university research, library committee reports to the resource okay. policy committee. Okay. Uh, and so. We see, we see all the university uh, library proposals and what they're planning to do. It's, uh, it's university resource and policy, isn't that what yes. it is? Yeah, okay. And so that's a committee so that... It's overarching that, for a while. Right. It, it, and you see, it's that committee that the, that the administration can bounce ideas off of when they're looking at overall changes to the university, you know, either plan-wise, you know, et cetera. You know, program-wise, they facilities, so long range, whatever. Yeah. Okay. And so, uh, as a result, you know, you see a lot of things that you never wouldn't have any idea about before. Right. You know, what's the uh, term of office? On that? Were, you, were you on the committee and then you became chair? I was on the committee for one year oh. and then elected chair, and I was chair for the next two years. Oh, okay. Now, one of the interesting things was is that was also the two years that, uh, you know, the first two years that we went to bowl games after a very long time. <laughs> and this was Bering's last two years, you know, as president. And he was very gracious. He took the six of us that were chairs of the six university, poly, you know, six poly, uh, Senate committees as his guest to the bowl games. <laughs> that hasn't happened since either. <laughs> hadn't happened. Of course, it couldn't happen years before that because Purdue never went to a bowl game. <laughs> we had the um, when Herman, uh, Mark Herman, and, and Bart Burrell were here in eighty one, eighty two. We did go to a Peach Bowl and a couple of them, but then until Tiller <laughs> came, there was there were nothing. There were no bowls. <laughs> <laughs> there were no bowls. <laughs> and see, and, and the uh, see, I went to Wisconsin the year after Wisconsin went to Rose Bowl. <laughs> I came to Purdue the year after Purdue went to the Rose Bowl. <laughs> that tells you and said, I didn't see another Rose Bowl until after I was retired. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, so it, it was kind of interesting from that aspect. 